Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Before the Bell. As always, I am your host, Matt Donato. This is episode number 13. And as always, Before the Bell is brought to you by RopeBreakWrestling.com. Get out of the bleachers and get in the ring. Now, there's been a lot of stuff going on lately. Um, and, you know, I always start off by saying, you know, sit back, relax, throw those headphones, and let me entertain you for 45 minutes, give or take. Uh, but this week, there's going to be no 45 minutes, give or take. I'm going to be completely honest with you. There's so much that I want to talk about that this will probably go over the 45-minute time limit, um, probably within an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess and say that's probably how long it's going to go because there's a lot of stuff that I want to talk about. Watch, I, this is the one time that I say it's going to go over and it'll actually go exactly 45 minutes. That's just how I do things here. Unpredictable. Before the bell's unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen. But uh, but I want to get this thing started. But before I can do that, i got to say, sit back, relax, throw those headphones in, and let me entertain you for as long as you're willing to listen. I think that's going to be my new tagline. For as long as you're willing to listen. Hey, if you're willing to listen five minutes, it's good with me. I don't, I don't, I, I appreciate every second you can give me. Um, unlike a couple other shows on Rope Break Wrestling. Um, not going to really name any names, but they, uh, they're, they're a little bit unappreciative of, of the fans. I take jabs at you guys all the time, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I really do appreciate you guys, especially you, Jose Paulino. I know that uh, the sharpshoot took a shot at you not that long ago. Um, wasn't really cool to do that. Unfair. Um, I believe uh, Aussie called uh, the rope breakers uh, fat, sweaty, sitting on their couch, uh, rubbing their stomach, eating Cheetos. Um, and pretty much alluded to the fact that you guys are nobodies. Uh, by saying we don't want you to present an award. That's not my decision. If it were up to me, I would have all of you guys presenting awards because you really are the ones who have made uh, every bit of this possible. But Austin wants to play the jerk, and he wants to you know, get only celebrities because you guys aren't good enough. You know that, that's, his, that's his choice. To be quite honest, I'm not going to you know, sit here and try to pretend like the golden ropes is, is my idea. You know, obviously, I help participate in it. Alec Harp helps participate in it. But this is all he's doing. It's his baby. He has full creative control over the golden ropes. This is his, you know, like I said, this is his baby. Um, he can do what he wants with it. So whether or not we have you guys, um, you know, presenting awards is completely up to him. Obviously, he doesn't want that happening. Like I said... I'm not a jerk like that. I would love to have you guys present. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, because, like I said, you guys you guys make this website what it is. Without you guys, we would not be here. Um, but um, I'm already wasting time, and I know you guys are chomping at the bit to listen to what I have to say. Um, or you got confused and thought this was some other podcast, and uh, and you're waiting for Alec to jump on. Nope, this is not React. This is before the bell. Um, so if you've hit the wrong podcast, uh, you can continue on with me if you want. I think I, I think I'm pretty damn entertaining. I don't know. I've had people tell me that. Um, okay, yeah, it was my mom, but she's a pretty reliable source. Um, all right, I'm I'm getting way off topic, which is if you know me, then you know that's typical of Matt Donato. It's what I do. So without further ado, let me jump into this bad boy. First things first, um, I, I really wanted to quickly touch on, and I say quickly, but like I said, if you know me, that's a bunch of bullshit. I can, Like I said before, I can hear the collective bullshit chants going off right now. Ha, <laughs> quickly. All right, he never does anything quickly. It's probably going to be like 20 minutes of him rambling about Roman Reigns. Um, but I wanted to quickly, I uh, know, bullshit. Wanted to talk about uh, Roman Reigns winning Superstar of the Year. Um, I know one of our writers uh, for RopeRigWrestling.com, Mitchell Jones, uh, recently wrote an article about it. Um, really, really um, 
expressing um, how frustrated he was that Roman Reigns won Superstar of the Year. I know that every other rope breaker, um, you know, I know Aussie and Alec were very vocal about them, you know, that they were frustrated that Roman Reigns won Superstar of the Year. And uh, I know that Mitchell got a lot of flack. I know the rope breakers came out in troves. They were, you know, really, really getting on uh, Mitchell's article, you know, really stating their case. And I got to say, I agree. I agree with what they're saying, and, and I understand where you guys are coming from with the with with the fact that it's just a slammy, and it's really not a big deal because nobody's going to remember it. I completely agree with that, and you know, you guys are making a hundred percent accurate statements. It's just a slammy. Nobody gives a shit about a slammy, and nobody's going to remember this. You're right, but for me, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because. It goes deeper than that for me. It's got nothing to do with the fact that he won a slammy because, like you guys said, it doesn't matter. Who who cares? For me, it goes. It's it's down to the fact that Roman Reigns is not ready to be pushed, and this, you know, him winning this Superstar of the Year award just solidifies the fact that they they are pretty much saying we're going to push this guy regardless of if he's ready. They for some reason think that he's going to be ready by WrestleMania, and I just don't see that happening. I know three or four months back, you know, I was looking at him as a guy, and I was saying, you know, I don't think he's ready to be a main event superstar. I don't think he's ready to be the face of the company yet, which is what they're pushing him for. But I was saying, you know what? There's plenty of time. They can really groom him. They can really do something. There could be character development. I'll be patient. I'll wait, see what happens. It could be surprising, and I could, two or three months down the road, say, you know what, now I see where they're going, now I see the possibility, I can see this working. Alright, fast forward two to three months, it's now two to three months, and I'm still saying the same fucking thing. He's not ready, and I don't understand why they why they got it in their heads that he is ready. You know, there's been zero character development, and this gets me frustrated because he does have so much potential. But Roman Reigns is still the Roman Reigns from the Shield, except Rollins and Ambrose are not with him anymore. That is the only difference. All they did, and this is lazy as hell, is they removed Ambrose and Rollins from the Shield, and now they have Roman Reigns. How do you go from a guy being so over at the Royal Rumble, over the more over than anybody else in that match. People stopped chanting Daniel Bryan and started chanting Roman Reigns. That tells you how over he is. How do you go from that to not even the soccer moms giving a shit anymore? That's that's bad. Soccer moms are always getting all hot and bothered every time freaking Lion Mane with his flowing black Hercules hair comes out. Um, No, that wasn't a, a Samoan reference because The Rock played Hercules. Um, that was just the first, th- first thing that popped in my head. Um, but he he just doesn't have the same appeal anymore. And it's because the WWE got their grubby fingers on him. That, that's really all it boils down to. Or I should say the WWE didn't get their grubby hands on him. You know, they didn't do anything with him. They took him, they pulled him out of the shield and said, you know what? Let's do nothing with him. Let's keep him where he is. He's hot. No, no, it doesn't. That never works. You need to build a character. It's so simple. It's 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 mind-boggling. That's gonna be my, another one of my catchphrases. I'm telling you guys right now. I'm making. I'm fucking making T-shirts. Mind-boggling. I quit. Um, I, I'm just gonna come up with an array of catchphrases, and um, seriously, he's gonna be one of them. There's things I constantly say a million times in in all of my podcasts. Um, I swear it's going to be a... I'm making t-shirts, I'm telling you. I'm I'm making t-shirts and I'm selling them. Um, But, you know, when when you take a guy... And I'll give you a quick reference. I said this before. I don't want to take up too much time. Because this is a topic that I want to talk about. But like I said, I don't want to waste so much time talking about this. There's so much more important stuff that I want to talk about. But if Hogan were to have left the NWO and kept the same theme song, kept the same attire, kept the same um, character and the same gimmick, 
but they were pushing him as 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 uh, Hulk Hogan with the red and yellows. How would that have worked? If uh, Triple H left to go back to his solo career after being in DX, yet they didn't change his attire, they didn't change his music, he still had the same gimmick, but they were pushing him as the game. How would that work? So when you take Roman Reigns out of the shield and you don't take away his music and you don't take away his attire and you keep everything the same, but you're pushing him as a different guy. You see where I'm going with this? It doesn't work. It it won't work and it can't work. And the fact that they, they, they're running out of time. WrestleMania season is upon us. We're coming really close to road to WrestleMania. There's not much time left for them to build this guy. He's not. He's been injured. He's been out. They've been giving him acting lessons, but that has not been helping. They really need to step it up. I don't think this is the year of Roman Reigns. I don't think that they're ready for Roman Reigns to be WWE World Heavyweight Champion. I really think that this could be detrimental. I mean, look at guys like Sheamus and Alberto Del Rio. Now, I'm, I'll be the first one to tell you I'm not a Del Rio or Sheamus fan by far. I, I can't stand either one of them. But I do truly believe that they could have done a whole hell of a lot better with the both of them. But what did they do? The same thing they did with Roman. You know, they never gave him, and this is the thing, they never gave Roman an identity. When you don't know who somebody is, how do you expect the fans to relate to them? How do you expect me to get into somebody I don't know? Would you marry somebody you don't know? No, because you don't know them. You, have, you you can't relate to them. Why was Stone Cold Steve Austin so successful? Because he was relatable. Why was The Rock so successful? Because he was relatable. He gave you things to go off of. You knew his character. You knew him. He made you feel like you knew him. Roman Reigns, I don't know him. And at this point, I don't care to know him. And that's a problem because I was really hot on Roman Reigns three four months down the road. Or, you know, back back when he was with The Shield... And, uh, you know, when, when he was getting, when he, when they were grooming him for his solo career, I was really, really hot on him. I thought this guy is going to be awesome. Then they take him away from the shield and then they just drop the ball. I mean, Seamus Del Rio, going back to what I was saying, um, I don't want to leave that unfinished. See, I do that from time to time. That's what you get here at Before the Bell. You, you, you're not going to get one clean, straight story on to the next. Now, that's boring. I'm going to talk about one thing, stop halfway in the middle, jump to something else, and then jump right back to what I was talking about before. Hopefully, uh, it's not really a good tactic because I probably am just confusing the hell out of you guys. You're probably like, what is this guy talking about? Holy shit, my head hurts. Go take a couple Excedrin. Pause this. Go take a couple Excedrin. Come on back, and I'll try to straighten things out. What I'm getting at is the fact that Roman Reigns is not ready for this. And, you know, this is the same thing that happened with Del Rio and Sheamus. Neither one of them were ready. Neither one of them were given an identity. They were never given a character. They were just pushed into the main event because they had the look. Sheamus was given the WWE Championship. Fail. Del Rio was given the WWE Championship. Fail. Fail. Now he's no longer in the company. You know, and like I said, I don't like either one of those guys. I'm not a fan of Del Rio. I really I really actually hate Del Rio. Um, not personally, I just hate his character, I hate his gimmick. I think I, I just don't like him at all. Same thing with Seamus. I could care less about about him as a character, as a wrestler. I just don't like him. I've never liked either one of them. But I'm being honest with you guys in saying that I really think that they could have done a hell of a lot better. Del Rio could have played that Mexican aristocrat beautifully. That should have been his gimmick. He should have been the guy who comes out and pays people off to either forfeit their matches or fight matches for him. That should have been his gimmick. Sheamus should have had a a brawler gimmick where he just beats the shit out of people and that didn't work. It doesn't ever work. And And I just feel like it's just ridiculous to me that they're, you know, two two times it's like, okay, it didn't work with Sheamus, didn't work with Del Rio. Oh, it'll work with Roman Reigns. Why? As you can hear, 
you know, he used to come out to thunderous applause. People would flip out with Roman Reigns. You would hear Roman Reigns chants. People were, you know, excited about him. To now, nobody cares. People are, he's getting booed now when he comes on the screen because nobody cares. He's even been saddled with five moves. You know you suck when you haven't even been in the business for two years and you're already being saddled with the five moves of doom. I mean, and that's not really him. Like I said, that's, that's just poor booking. But I spent way too much time on this topic about Roman Reigns. To summarize, my issue with this is not him winning the Slammy for Superstar of the Year. It's the fact that they're putting so much stock in him when he is not ready for that yet. That is my issue. And I promise I am now done with this topic. I will move on. 15 minutes is far too long to talk about Roman Reigns. Let's continue. Um, I want to talk about something that happened uh, a couple days ago that really, really got me uh, excited. Really, really got me, um, really resonated with me. And that is Triple H uh, held a conference call for NXT TakeOver Our Evolution, um, which uh, for those of you who haven't seen the pay-per-view yet, I'm saving the best for last. I don't want to give away any spoilers. Therefore, I am saving my review of NXT TakeOver Our Evolution for the end of this podcast, which is why I'm saying I need to kind of move along. I didn't want to take that much time on Roman Reigns. I want to spend most of my time talking about that because that, for me, was one of the biggest highlights of this week. Um, And I want to really spend a lot of time really going into that with you guys. You know, giving you know, giving you my take, hearing what you guys have to say as well. Um, but like I said, as a wrestling fan, I wouldn't feel right spoiling it for you guys. I don't like giving out spoilers. I love being surprised. Surprised. That's that's one of the best things about being a fan is when you get that surprise. I know you guys can relate that mark out moment when Sting returns at Survivor Series. You didn't see it coming. Yeah, it was on the you know. Yeah, it was kind of spoiled online, but you still weren't sure. Those surprises are the best. When The Rock returns at Raw to confront Rusev, nobody saw that coming. And you jump out of your seat and you yell. And you flip out, you mark out. I know all of you guys can relate with that. We're all wrestling fans. We all know what that means. So that's why I don't like spoiling, because I like those surprises myself, and I would never take that away from anybody else. That's just not how I like to run things. Um, So that's why I'm saving it for the end of this podcast. So if you stick with me for that long, I truly appreciate it. Um, You'll be hearing my NXT TakeOver review and opinion. Uh, But for right now, we're going to talk about the conference call that, um, you know, that had to do with NXT TakeOver, uh, our evolution. Um, You know, Triple H called his his conference call that he he does um, before every single NXT. You know, it's not even a pay-per-view. I was saying pay-per-view, but... It's mostly on the network. Obviously, if you live in uh, Japan, if you live in uh, the UK, you don't have the network yet. Um, so that would be kind of a pay-per-view, I believe. But for for everybody else who has it, it would be a special event. Um, so he calls this conference call before every single NXT special event um, in order to promote the event. And every time it's it's oh he always says some great stuff, but this time it really resonated with me because a lot of the questions he was he was asked a lot of really great questions. Um, off the bat, I just want to um, state that he did say that he's they're they're working feverishly uh, to get the network into the UK, uh, probably due to all the backlash from uh, all of our overseas friends from our friends across the pond. Um, you know, really giving it to the WWE, um, which is funny to me. Hopefully you guys get it soon. I love the, the network. I think it's great. Um, but that's a, that's a review for another day. Um, what I really want to talk about, I want to kind of take apart this conference call for you guys and really kind of just lay out a couple of the highlights that I really, really, um, that really stuck with me personally. Um, first being uh, Charlotte. I know people were really upset about Charlotte's loss on uh, Monday Night Raw. I know that really, really annoyed a lot of people, myself included. Um, you know, Charlotte debuts on Raw. Um, not her call up, but they wanted to bring her up to really kind of get fans to know who she is. Um, so they call her up on Raw. And, you know, they give her her match with Natalia, which 
had been had it been given more time would have easily been match of the night on Raw. Um, if you haven't seen the original takeover, the very first takeover special event, um, go find it, download it, whatever you got to do. What maybe it's on YouTube? I'm not sure. Um, watch it, and specifically watch Natalia versus Charlotte. Easily one of the best matches uh, I've seen in a long time. One of the best divas matches in recent years that I that I can think of. With that being said, I was excited. Wow, she's going to be wrestling Natalia. This could really steal the show. Um, but the match was really short um, and ended up in Natalia rolling up Charlotte for the victory. Um, not really even putting a finisher on her. Um, you know, definitely not what these two women are capable of for sure. Um, very disappointing for a lot of fans, like I said, myself included. But when Triple H was asked that question, um, you know, why did she lose so quickly? His response was, and if you've watched the sharpshoot, they've already covered this, and they they said that um, I know that they all kind of alluded to it being poor booking. They they were annoyed by it, and they thought it was poor booking on WWE's part, um, as far as um, her losing and having such a short of a match. Terrible booking. Um, but if uh, you know, honestly, if you know the guys over at Sharpshoot. Um, did their homework and actually knew what they were talking about, then they would know that the reason it was cut short had nothing to do with booking. It, it was a business decision. Um, you know, when you work in a live television show, you really, some things end up getting cut short. They knew that they had other important matches on the show that they had to push for their pay-per-view, so they made the decision that this isn't technically Charlotte's call-up. She really wasn't supposed to win. Um, She was supposed to look stronger than she did, but out of all the matches on the card, they they made the decision that, you know what, this is a match we're going to have to cut short so that we can make room for for some of the other matches. Had nothing to do with booking, Um, and like I said, if, you know, the sharpshoot did their homework, you know, uh, not not trying to, not trying to poke at anybody, not not trying to blame anybody, but honestly, it was just... Quick stroll on the internet. Go to freaking ropebreakwrestling.com. It was all up there. I put it up there myself. Quick quick check on that, and they would have known that it had nothing to do with booking, but that's the sharpshoot for you. They they don't take their time. They don't research or anything. They just kind of flap their gums and hope for the best. But I uh, that that's, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing against them. I'm not, you know, trying to shoot them down. Um... They they try their best. They really do. And I give them credit. But, uh, yeah, definitely had nothing to do with booking. Um, you know, they just kind of sounded stupid by saying that. But that's that's just them. Not Like I said, nothing against them. Nothing against a sharpshoot. You know, Aussie tries. He, he does his best. Um, it's just that his best is not good enough. Um, so that that's pretty much what Triple H said on that. But he did also know, and this is something that, that stuck with me, that when she does get called up, he does plan on booking her strong. Which is good, because that's what she needs. She needs to be booked strong. She's very, very talented. Um, he also said, and, and they said this on the sharpshoot, and uh, he, he said that within six months, um, he... You know, when he said when she's gonna call when she gets called up that she'll be booked stronger, he said within six months. And they did bring that up on the sharpshoot. And I know that a rope breaker um messaged in and said that he thought that Triple H might have said within six months and not just six months straight out. So it could be one month, it could be six months, it could be two, three, four months, you know, anywhere from one to six months that she could be called up. And uh, in typical Aussie fashion, he decided to completely and arrogantly uh, argue with the rope breaker, um, tell him he was completely wrong and that, you know, Triple H said six months as if he had just had a conversation with Triple H five minutes prior, um, which he didn't. Aussie has just as much information as I do, and I'm here to tell you, sir, that you may be very right. He may have said six uh, in Within six months, I do think that is what he said, um, but don't argue with Aussie because he's never wrong. Um, 
I've known him for a while. That's just what he does. Um, you know, I like the guy. He's one of my closest friends, but he has a habit of doing that. You know, he has a habit of getting very, very strongly opinionated. You can never, he can never be wrong. Um, you know, he's got to learn how to handle it, to be quite honest. Um, so I do apologize for, uh, his rudeness to whoever that was. I don't remember exactly who chimed in and, and said that, but, uh, you're not going to get that kind of ridicule on Before the Bell. I promise you that. I, I, I'm open to everybody's suggestions. I will not argue with you. I will give you my opinion, um, respectfully, because I do respect you guys, um, but getting back on the topic, getting back to that conference call, um, really promising stuff. Um, he also mentioned uh, Sami Zayn and uh, Adrian Neville talk really highly about Sami Zayn, even comparing him to uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, which is a massive honor for Triple H to say that. Um, really said he loves how he can captivate the emotion of a crowd, which is so accurate. He's been doing that. And if you don't know anything about Sami Zayn outside of the WWE, I... I you know, I invite you to go check out El Generico. Go check out his stuff in Ring of Honor. Go check out his stuff in, um, I want to say he wrestled in Pro Wrestling Gorilla. Go check Go check all of his, his work out. It's very well done. And he has always had that unique ability to really capture the emotion of a crowd. People always get emotionally invested with this guy. Um, and he has these facial expressions that just tell a story. Triple H um, definitely noted that. I agree with him. It's it's amazing what this guy can do. Um, and Triple H said as soon as he can find his voice, which I think on uh, NXT last week he did, you know, getting mad at Adrian Neville. Um, you know, he, he he's getting there. And I'm excited to see what, what he does. And once he does, he's going to go places. And Triple H said that as well. So Triple H very high on Adrian Neville and very high especially on Sami Zayn. And he said he looks forward to seeing these guys get called up um, hopefully in the next six months. Um, so hopefully they get called up sooner rather than later. I think these guys would be a great asset um, to the WWE roster. Um, you know, I think these guys should have been called up um, yesterday. But this is another issue, is that NXT is also another company, and you need to look at it from the standpoint that they also need to keep NXT interesting. So, yeah, it would be good for Raw to have Sami Zayn and Adrian Neville and Charlotte and all of these great talents move on up to the main roster. But then that kind of leaves the current one kind of dry because there's not many people right now coming up through uh, the Performance Center you know, that I see that really has that it factor. Um, obviously, you have Hideo Itami. You have uh, Finn Balor who will still be there. Um and, uh, obviously, uh, Kevin Owens, um, which, you know, even, you know, in, in the conference call, Triple H also made mention to the fact that, um, because, you know, he was addressing the rumor that they need to be there for at least two years before they're allowed to be called up. He addressed the rumor and pretty much said that's complete bullshit. It really depends on who you are. And, and he really used as examples Finn Balor, Hideo Itami, and Kevin Owens. He said, these are three guys that have already made it in this business. They've already, you know, paid their dues. They've already, you know, done what they're already extremely talented. The only reason they're in NXT right now is so that they can learn the the way that WWE does things because there's a lot of things. For instance, he, he mentioned that Finn Balor um, was not used to the production side of the WWE. You know, when you come out on an entrance and there's a camera, you have to look at a specific camera. He wasn't used to that, so that's something he had to learn. Um but other than that, they're absolutely ready for the main roster, and he said so himself. Um, so that's complete bullshit. Um, as far as those three coming up to the main roster, it could happen at any time, to be honest. Um, so, and that's going to be, you know, that there's so much talent coming up. I just hope that they can fill that void again once those ta- once that talent leaves NXT. They can fill that void. Um, in NXT, I think that's you know one of the reasons why they kind of hold off on on these call ups is because of the fact that it does kind of leave a huge gap in NXT, and if that programming doesn't draw interest from fans, it's not going to stay on TV 
and then NXT goes by the wayside, and that doesn't that that hurts WWE too. So they really need to. It's a balancing act. They need to make sure NXT stays afloat, but they also need to make sure Raw stays afloat, and they need to make sure that they're they are moving these guys up. But they have to do it. Um, they have to do it very very um, meticulously. There, there's you know very methodically. There's a method to the way they have to do this. It's not just well this guy's ready. Let's call him up. You can't. It doesn't work that way. And I know a lot of people want that. I want that, but you know. Looking at it from a business standpoint, it doesn't always work out uh, that way. Also wanted to point out that he's looking. He, there's been rumors of uh, the NXT title being defended on the kickoff show of major WWE pay-per-views. Um, I think that would be great, and that's not be, that's, that has not been ruled out. Um, so that's something to look forward to in the future. Um he was also asked about heavily scripted promos and, and and what he thinks about that. And, you know, he went on to say that, and this is something else that I, that I really wanted to talk about. He goes on to say that he doesn't think heavily scripted promos are a bad thing. Or he doesn't think scripted promos are a bad thing. He also mentions that when they practice it, they do ad-lib. Um... See, I have an issue with this because for me as a fan, it bothers me when I see somebody doing a really heavily scripted promo, and I think it really takes away from that specific wrestler. Um, I just feel like when they're not being allowed to speak as themselves, it really forms a disconnect between that 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 wrestler and the fan watching them. It takes a very, very unique and a very, very specifically talented wrestler or superstar um, we don't say wrestler anymore a uh, superstar to to really be able to read from a script word for word and be able to still connect with a crowd not very many people can do that and there's really nobody that I'm looking at right now in the business that can do that and I know a lot of people will probably say Dean Ambrose but I'm going to be completely 100% honest with you and this is um, I, I might get flack for this but it's the truth I'm not impressed with his with his promos. I'm really not impressed with Dean Ambrose promos in the WWE. And I'll tell you why. It's not because they're bad, but it's because it's not um it, it they're they're not what he's capable of. Take a moment, pause this video, and go watch a John Moxley promo. I know I said this before, but I'm serious. Seriously go do that right now. Go watch a John Moxley promo. Watch it, feel it, come back. And then tell him, and then try to tell me that the promos he does in the WWE are anywhere near those. They are completely watered down. And I think he's even said himself that he hasn't like he doesn't like a single promo he's done so far in the WWE. And that's because they put a leash on him. When you have a guy that you know can talk, let the leash off of him. They think the crowd loves him now. Wait until he goes crazy. Wait until he cuts a promo like he did in the independent circuits in PWG in um and every other independent circuit that he's that he's worked for, I can't really think of any more names off the top of my head right now. Um, but I know he's wrestled for a ton of them. Go watch them. John Moxley. You will not be disappointed. If you're a fan of pro wrestling and you love a good promo, you will not be disappointed because this guy is phenomenal. It's the reason he was scouted. It was the reason he was picked up. And the fact that they're stifling him, they're, they're you know, they're making him... A promo leaked online, you know, a script of his leaked online. And then when you watched it, I I don't remember the exact pay-per-view. I want to say it was, I want to say it was, I don't don't know, Night of Champions, SummerSlam. Maybe it was SummerSlam, but I know when you went back and watched it on the pay-per-view, it leaked before the pay-per-view aired. And then you watched the pay-per-view, and you listened to his promo, and it was word for word what was on that script that was leaked. So you know it was a legitimate script. So he's reading word for word what they're writing for him, and that's not him. He's never He doesn't read from a script. You're watering him down, and that, that's my issue you know, with him. Um, and that's, that's my biggest problem with scripted promos, is they don't come off... It's hard to, to emote. It's hard to really give off emotion. And to really put yourself into it when you're reading lines that somebody else wrote for you. You know, right now there's a guy sitting at a desk trying to think the way that Dean Ambrose would think. 
how would Dean Ambrose say this? And then Dean Ambrose has to read that promo, you know, that somebody else wrote trying to think like him. And it just, it, it's just a big mess. It doesn't work. Um, it's really difficult to do scripted promos. You know, they used to do back in the day the old bullet uh, point style, which is they would just list things that they want, like points that they wanted you to talk about. And I want you to hit boom, 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 boom. I want you to talk about each one of these things. And then, you know, you just fill in the lines, fill in the gaps, ad lib, do whatever you got to do to fill in the gaps. And it was successful because people could connect because they were putting themselves, when they were cutting these promos, all the ad libs were them. It was them. It was coming from their mind. So people were able to connect so much stronger. You know, and that's the problem with scripted promos. It's so much more difficult to connect unless you get that special guy. But even a guy like Dean Ambrose who can cut a damn good promo, you know, still still struggles with this. Take the leash off of him. Stop with the scripted promos. They're, they don't work. And, you know, they're really, really hurting your company. And they're, they're hurting, you know, they're hurting your company creatively. Um, you know, that's my big issue with it. So I don't actually agree with Triple H. Um, but for the most part, I do agree with, with everything he said. Um, you know, he really seems to have a grasp on the future of the WWE. And if this conference call reflects Triple H's true feelings, then I can honestly tell you guys that I really feel confident that the future of the WWE looks really, really bright. Um, once Vince McMahon leaves and Triple H takes over, I feel like that we're going to get a really, really solid um, professional wrestling company once again. Um, you know, I don't like to blame Vince for everything. I just feel like, I just feel like really what it is, what it boils down to is creative differences backstage. I think Vince has a really solid idea for what he wants for the company, but he's trying to give Triple H some creative control. And you have to kind of give in to what Vince wants. At, at least that's what I've gathered from people who've worked with him is at the end of the day, he owns the company, so what he wants, he gets. So really, he's giving you control, but not really. He's kind of just telling you, I'm giving you control, but if I don't like it, I'm going to change it. So really, he's not. He's just kind of putting them there as a placeholder so he doesn't have to be there every day. It's kind of what I gather. No, no offense to him. I mean, he's, he's a multi-multi-multi he's multi, multi multi millionaire, billionaire. He can do whatever the hell he wants. But I feel like his idea for the business has sort of like an 80s style to it, like a like the 80s wrestling. You know, you have these big, bulky guys. You know, they don't say a lot on the microphone. They have a few catchphrases. They get in the ring. The matches are short. You know, 80s, early 90s, you know what I mean? And I think Triple H has, an, has a late 90s, early 2000s concept for the company. And I think that creatively, they just keep clashing. The problem with an 80s style wrestling in today's generation is it just it, it can't work. You know, the 80s, and, you know, this, I might get flack for this too, but at the end of the day, you know what? This is my show, and I can do whatever the hell I want. I say that all the time. I can do what I want, because this is my show. But I feel like the 80s, 80s wrestling was a dumbed-down version of pro wrestling. It was, it, it was a dumber version of pro wrestling. Um, you know, it was for the simple-minded... It wasn't complex maneuvers. It was just really, really straightforward stuff. Anybody could watch it. And I think Vince is kind of stuck there. I think that's what he wants to do. For whatever reason it is, I don't know. But I think that he just really, that's that's what he's going towards. I think that's just instinctually what he goes for because that's what he was brought up in. So I think that that's his style of wrestling, something maybe that he relates to. Um, and Triple H growing up, and being a part of the early, the the mid to late '90s and early 2000s, and obviously still today, you know that's what he relates to: being popular, being big, and being involved in early night or late '90s to uh, early 2000s. That's what he was involved in. So I think he relates to that. So I think that's his vision. I think Finn's vision is the '80s, and I think they just clash. I think that's why we get such a a huge cluster every time we watch Raw. You know, you get some matches that are really good. Wow, these are the great well-developed storylines and then you get some that are just they don't work and I think it's because of the fact that Vince tries to incorporate the 80s feel into his company and it's just not something that fans today 
you know, will be interested in because, you know, they're, when, you know, today's wrestling is so fast paced, we just don't have the attention span for it anymore. We want to see death defying flips over the top rope. We want to see chair shots. It's hard to go from what we are now, this, this really high end wrestling and go back to a dumbed down version. It just, it doesn't work. So I think that's really the issue with, with pro wrestling right now and the WWE and specifically Monday Night Raw is that, that, that clash between concepts of what, what they both want for the business. Um, obviously that there's, there's no factual evidence behind that. That's just, you know, how I feel. Um, but, uh, we're, we're 40 minutes in normally let's go 45 minutes, but I am not done yet because it's coming to that time. Um, where I want to talk about, uh, NXT, our evolution. Um, so if you haven't watched it yet and you do not want to be spoiled, this is where I say goodbye to you. Um, and, uh, if you have watched it and you want to get my take on it, then we will continue. And I appreciate anybody who has stayed on this long with me. Um, but for those of you who haven't watched NXT yet and are leaving, I just want to say thank you for tuning into Before the Bell. I really, really appreciate it. Um, if you have anything to comment about the show, um, anything you want to argue with me about, throw it in the comments. Um, I'm open to whatever. I'm not going to shut you down like the sharpshoot. Um, you know, I respect your opinions, and, you know, I, I love conversing with you guys. I like talking wrestling with you guys. Like, I, like, like I've said before, I'm a diehard fan of professional wrestling. That's one of the main reasons that I joined Aussie and Alec in starting this group is because we're all fans of wrestling. We're all passionate about it. And I know you guys love talking about it. And I know for a fact that you guys probably don't have too many friends or family members who watch pro wrestling, so you don't really have anybody to talk to it. You mention wrestling to somebody, and we and we all know that look we get. You watch pro wrestling? You know, that's that garbage look that we all get. Pro wrestling is so fake. And it's frustrating. It's like you don't understand. And uh, I'm here to tell you that I understand. I get it. So you ever want to talk wrestling? comment there, Twitter, Facebook, I'm everywhere, I'm here to talk wrestling, I love it, and I know you guys too, do too, or else you wouldn't be here, um, so with that being said, for those of you who are leaving us, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, make sure to to uh, like our page on Facebook, facebook.com slash wrestling. make sure to follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash wrestling, and uh, make sure to uh, check out the Golden Rope Awards on uh, that that are, are you can go right now and you can vote. Go to ropebreakwrestling.com. Make sure you bookmark it that way. You can always keep coming. Uh, that way you don't have to keep digging around uh, the garbage to find the best rumors. They're all in one place. Ropebreakwrestling.com. So go there. Uh, click on the uh, page that will bring you to. Uh, the page that will allow you to vote. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have categories like Superstar of the Year. We have Holy Shit Moment of the Year. Um, we have Ferocious Finisher. Uh, we have Superstar. Or I think I already just said that, but I'm going to repeat it again. We have Superstar of the Year, just in case you didn't hear me say it the first time. Um, I'm losing my mind, by the way, if you haven't already noticed. Um, there, there are so many. And, of course, we have podcast of the year, so don't forget to vote before the bell. Um, right now, uh, the Sharpshoot, I think, is winning. Um, React closely is, is coming up close. And, uh, actually, sadly enough, uh, Rope Break Radio, which isn't even a thing anymore, has more votes than I do. So, uh, help, help a brother out. Go click on that. Uh, go vote for before the bell. Um, help me out. I would really appreciate it. Um, and uh, with that being said, thank you for watching. Um, and uh, I hope to see you guys next week. Same exact time, same exact place. Take it easy, guys. All right. 
So for those of you that have stayed on and have continued to listen uh, through the rest of this, um, we are now 45 minutes into the podcast. This overtime is specifically for you um, because I'm, I'm getting to the point of the show that I act, this is what I've been waiting to talk about all night long, and that is NXT TakeOver, um, our evolution. The name is kind of odd. I get where they're going with it. Um, our evolution. It's like our evolution. Huh, clever. Anyway, um, so we're going to go match by match, and I'm going to give you the rundown of what happened um, and pretty much my opinion. So we start the show off, and we start the show off with the debut of Kevin Owens, um, also known as Kevin Steen. If you haven't seen his work in Ring of Honor, I invite you to do that. Go watch his stuff. It's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it is awesome. Um, he debuts against C.J. Parker. And what a way to kick off the show. I don't know about any of you guys, but I was fucking pumped. I was marking out to Kevin Owens. I know the crowd was. The crowd was nuts. Um, starts off against C.J. Parker. Uh, he starts off with his patented uh, charge in the corner. Um, with the two splashes, and he does that somersault uh, splash uh, thing that he always did in Ring of Honor, which was just awesome for me. I'm marking out because I'm like, holy shit, it's Kevin Steen. Um, you know, does a couple other things. Uh, he he hits him with a lariat, uh, then does like a pump handle uh, slam uh, type deal, which was awesome. And then he does his uh, pop-up power bomb. Uh, and then ends up winning. Um, awesome match. Really, really showcased. Oh, and before I forget, he did that awesome dive off the top, over the top rope, uh, that like somersault. Um, and I know a lot of people were surprised. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't surprised. It was awesome, and I definitely marked out for that too. Um, even though I knew he does this kind of stuff. But I loved seeing the faces of people who don't know who he is. And seeing a guy of his size doing a somersault over the top rope like that. I mean, you don't ever see guys his size doing things like that. Um, So it was pretty impressive. Uh, His debut uh, went off without a hitch. Excited to have uh, Kevin Owens in the uh, WWE. And the Kill Owens Kill chance going crazy when he came out. Um, Really awesome. It just rolls off the tongue. You know, it, it, it's just as good as kill Steen, kill, fight Steen, fight, fight Owens, fight. You know, it it just fight Owen, fight. Just rolls off the tongue. Loved it. Um, next, we had the uh, NXT Tag Team Championship match between the VOD Villains and the uh, Lucha Dragons, um, which is uh, Kalisto and uh, Sin Cara. Um, and, uh, actually a pretty solid match. All I mean, I, I like the Lucha Dragons. I think they have a lot of potential. I really like their, their moves. Um, I think it was smart to put them together. Um, Kalisto is extremely impressive in that ring. Everything he does is just awesome. Um, the VOD villains, I know, I know, um, Aussie has said before, I know Alec has said they don't really care for the VOD villains. I actually like them. This is honestly, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm not going to lie. This is my first time actually seeing them. I've heard, I, I knew who they were, but I'd never really watched them as a tag team. Um, and I actually liked them a lot. I liked their gimmick. Um, I know a lot of people probably won't like it. And I understand that. Um, I don't know, something about their gimmick for me, it, it's just, it's an interesting, it's an original gimmick. Um, so I think that's really what does it for me. I'm not saying it's a good gimmick, I'm just saying it, I like it because it's original. Um, and I think they're both really talented. I like the old school styles. Um, I think they're both really good in the ring. Um, you know, this match, you know, was was, was a great match. Um, really well done by both. I thought it, it, it really... Um, see, this is what tag team matches should be. Especially over a title. I mean, come on. Why, why is the NXT tag team division showing up the main roster tag team division? That is sad. Um, awesome match. Both teams did amazing. Uh, the Lucha Dragons win this match, and uh, 
there's really nothing more I can say other than, like I just said, awesome freaking match. Um, so we're moving on. Um, the next one was uh, Ty Dillinger versus Baron Corbin. Let me let me let me just say this real quick. I fucking love that guy. I can't even express to you how much I love Baron Corbin. Just everything about him, you know, is just awesome. I love, you know, I love how they how they're booking him. I love the fact. I love his entrance music. I love his gimmick, his character. You know, that loner really kind of reminds me of a Raven. Um, type character. Um, that's the first thing I thought of when I saw him. Um, you know, I think if they continue on this, they could really do a lot of stuff with him. Obviously, not a main event talent, but who cares? To me, that doesn't matter. Um, I think this guy could be really good. I love the camera angle that they use too. Um, if you get a chance, go back and look. Just look at the camera angle. It's just fantastic. Um, and then I know a lot of people were upset. I know Alec was very vocal about being upset that this, you know, match didn't last very long. Um, he didn't think it was that good. Um, as far as wrestling goes, no, it wasn't a good wrestling match. Um, I think the moves that he did do were really good. His finisher, end of days, is just freaking awesome. Um, and then obviously he wins. I thought it, I thought there was a lot deeper than just I. I felt like the character development in this match. Um, they've been doing this for a lot now, for a lot for a lot of time now. They've been um, building him um, by having these fast kind of squash matches in a sense, um, which I'm perfectly okay with, um, as long as there's an outcome. As long as you know, I think obviously this is building up. He looks really really strong. Nobody can beat him. And then you have Bull Dempsey, who looks really really strong. Nobody can beat him. So I think that's going to be a good draw match. Um, I'm not a fan of Bull Dempsey. I mean, I don't hate the guy. I just don't think that he's that great. Um, but that's the match that's going to come up next. I, I like I like Baron Corbin a lot. Um, so I really did like those matches because I really like his character. Um, and then we get one of the matches that everybody has been waiting for. The Ascension versus Hideo Itami and Finn Balor. Um, I believe the in-ring debut of Finn Balor. Um, and... I, and no, maybe they have wrestled before. If if they have, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I haven't really had the opportunity to watch much NXT. I've been very busy with work and stuff like that. So if they have, in fact, um, if they've wa- if if they have wrestled, let me know because I, I do. I would like to know that. Um, this match was was awesome. This is another amazing um, tag team match. Might have just been for. Um, the fact that I'm a huge Kenta Mark and I'm a huge Prince Devitt Mark. So seeing these two guys, I know that's not their names anymore, but um, I, I'll always know them as that. Um, I respect their new names and I will call them that, but you know they'll always be Kenta and Prince Devitt to me. So seeing them finally debut in the WWE, you know this this match could have sucked and I would have still loved it. But this match was awesome. A lot of great in-ring storytelling. And, uh, yeah, we're going to address the elephant in the room right now. That entrance, though. Come on, guys. Tell me you didn't jump out of your seat when you saw... when when you As soon as I heard the heartbeat and I heard the new music and I saw the smoke and I saw the people on their hands and knees, the, the creatures or whatever they were, tell me you didn't jump out of your seat. If you know anything about Prince Devitt... I knew this was coming, and I called it. I said to I said to Alec, I messaged him right away. They're going, word for word, I said to him, they're going to use his fucking makeup. That's what I said. They're going to let him use fucking face paint. Something I know a lot of fans of Prince David have been waiting for is that face paint because it's so awesome. He used it all the time in uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. That was kind of his gimmick, and his entrances have always been top-notch. Some of the greatest entrances in pro wrestling history. Go watch some of them from New Japan. They're phenomenal. This one was right up there. Awesome entrance. You know, he's just so natural at it. The face paint, everything. His entrance alone was a mark-out moment for me. I flipped shit when I saw that. So excited. Um, And the match itself was just phenomenal. Both guys look great. Um, Hideo Itami going for that GTS. 
another mark out moment. I was like, holy shit, he's going to use the GTS. They're going to let him use it. Um, obviously, didn't happen. Um, part of me kind of wonders if they told him to do that kind of as a, as, as a kind of an, uh, kind of a jab at punk, um, do it, but don't actually do it just to kind of, you know, kind of put it out there like, yep, we're going to let him use the GTS, um, or the G2S, that's go to sleep, that's, um, and for those of you who don't know, Kenta kind of popularized that, and Punk's took the, he borrowed the move from him. He didn't steal it, and it was a mutual respect between the two. But Kenta is the, is the pretty much, I mean, he's the first guy to use it, but he kind of popularized it, pretty much originated it, if you will. Um, but there's, you know, there's so much I can say about this match. I, I just loved every second of it. Really, really was into it. Couldn't keep my eyes off the screen. Um, the double uh, stomp off the top rope, beautiful. Um Love that move. Both guys looked great. And just just an amazing match. And just the fact that Finn Balor came out with his... I can't get enough of that. Came out with his face paint. Had me out of my seat and yelling. Oh, man. All right. Because we're, we're kind of running time, I'm going to... And Hideo Itami and Finn Balor, obviously, won. And the Ascension will probably get called up now. Um, they, there was actually a vignette on SmackDown. Um, so they are go- going to be called up very, very soon. Um, probably within the next month or so. So we have that to look forward to. I think that'll be great. They need that for the, for the tag team division. They really need a strong tag team. My only question is after, actually, I, I don't know. I do, I don't want Finn Balor and, and, and Hideo Itami to be a tag team. I really think they need to be a, they need to be solo. It kind of bothers me that they're a tag team. I know that he was only there to help him, but I have this this strange feeling that they're going to push them as a tag team. I, I just that's how WWE operates. I'm just really worried that they're going to do that because that's not good. It's not best for business. They need to be solo competitors. Hideo Itami and Finn Balor need to go solo. I'm really worried about that. Hopefully, 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 my instincts are wrong, but. I'm worried, uh, but moving on uh, to the the next match, another amazing match in my opinion, uh, the NXT Women's Championship. First thing off the bat, I gotta say Sasha Banks really, really impressed me. At one point, I texted uh, Alec and I said, "Wow, this girl is good. She really, really impressed me." Um, really pulled out all the stops. I knew she was talented, but I mean, she really, really did a great job. And so did I mean Charlotte already knew, you know, it was great. Um, so many, so many dangerous maneuvers. Um, suicide dive um, through the ropes, the uh, backflip off the top rope, landing on her feet. That impressed the hell out of me because I've seen guys do that and not even be able to land on their feet. She landed on her feet without even getting, without even losing her balance. Um, there was just so much great chemistry in this match. It was just phenomenal. Every bit of it was awesome. And then that finisher, unexpected, off the top rope, just amazing. One, two, three, and then Charlotte, obviously, re- you know, she retained her title. Just a great match all around. Loved every second of it. Um, man, what a fucking pay-per-view, guys. Seriously. I can't even, I can't even talk enough about it. Um... Just everything about this pay-per-view was phenomenal. And then uh, moving on to the main event of the evening. um, The NXT Championship, Sami Zayn versus Adrian Neville. What a match. Holy shit. I can't even begin to express how awesome this match was. I know you guys saw it. I know you guys know what I'm talking about. But, wow. Wow. Um, so Sami Zayn, uh, and Adrian Neville put on a show of a lifetime. These two guys really put it on the line. So many amazing maneuvers, so much, um, so much ingenuity. I mean, these guys really did so much amazing in-ring work. If you know anything about me, 
then you know that I am a stickler for mat wrestling. That <clears throat> I am a huge, excuse me, I'm a huge mat wrestling fan. Um, and uh, I the every match right now on on this on this card had a lot of mat wrestling and had a lot of great technique in it. And that's something that that I look for in a match. And on top of that, they were able to everything. It was written properly. It was booked properly. The match placement was everything was properly placed. And this main event was just phenomenal. That um, I forget the name of the move. It's like a headbuster. Where where Neville, if you know the name of this move, let me know because I'm drawing a blank. But when he jumps on the on the shoulders of Sami Zayn and then does like a backflip. And kind of pile drives uh, Sami Zayn into the mat. That was a holy shit moment right there. That's a dangerous move. So I'm I'm pretty impressed at not only them but the WWE for allowing them to do that. If the WWE even knew, um, everything about that match was phenomenal. The storytelling was just incredible, amazing, impressive. There's, I mean, I, I literally could sit here for hours and talk about how everything in that match. You know, the crowd was phenomenal, too. That's something else I got to say. The crowd was amazing. I love the NXT uh, arena because of the fact that it's so intimate. You know, the fact that when you're there, you feel it, it seems so much louder because it's such a smaller arena, and the fans are always so into it. You know, they were hot for Zayn coming out. They were hot for Zayn all the way through. And then you know they were they even chanted this ref sucks which I was dying that 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 was that was hilarious because um, the ref of course get knocked out like three times um, he gets knocked out the second time and then as soon as Zane jumps on you know he's struggling to get to his feet and then Zane jumps on uh, or Neville jumps on Zane to pin him and all of a sudden the ref is perfectly fine I'm gonna count now one two three. Um, obviously didn't get to three because Sami Zayn kicks out and ends up winning the NXT Championship. It's about damn time that guy has earned it. He earned it before he even stepped foot in NXT, but this guy has really worked his ass off. So pumped that he finally got it. Um, the little exchange between him and Neville at the end was awesome. He went to go shake, he put his hand out to shake, and then Neville kicked it, and people really played the crowd. To, you know, the crowd booed him. And then jumped in for that hug. I thought that was an awesome addition. Um, having the entire locker room come out. I love that Kevin Owens came out. Big hug. Obviously, if you don't know the story, you don't know why that happened and why he came out and hugged him. They've been on, been wrestling together for, I think it's like 12 years. Um, if you don't know the rivalry, Kevin Steen versus El Generico, Ring of Honor, go look it up because it is phenomenal. Um amazing stuff. Everybody was out there, you know, congratulating him. Um, everybody leaves. He has his moment of glory. People are flipping out. He gets out of the ring. Kevin Owens comes back out to congratulate him again, hugs him. Um, I was a little disappointed at that. I was kind of like, man, when he first came out, I'm kind of like, man, I kind of wish that they, they hadn't played the buddy-buddy role because now it's going to look weird if they ever do a rivalry. You know, then he comes back out a second time, and I'm like, all right, you know, it's nice, whatever. They can they can do whatever with this. They can do a best friend storyline if they want. He hugged him, you know, kissed him on the head. Awesome job. I love you, buddy. They're walking. His arm is over him, and then boom. The moment I had been waiting for happened, and I kind of had a feeling as they're walking up the ramp that this was going to happen. He slams him to the ground and then hits him with that power bomb to the apron that he's known for, he's famous for. Kevin Steen, Ke Kevin Owens. Famous for this maneuver in Ring of Honor. Um, he's done it to uh, Sami Zayn, El Generico, millions of times. Um, hits him with that patented move, setting up a rivalry. So excited that that happened. I'm so happy that the WWE capitalized on this rivalry. One of the greatest rivalries in wrestling history. And it hasn't even been on a big stage yet. That's just my opinion, but I really do think that's the truth. One of the greatest rivalries of all time. Um, and it's now going to be in the WWE. And I can't even begin to tell you as a wrestling fan how excited I am about it. Um, honestly, if I had to rate 
this show. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a rating for the show. I'm gonna give you my rating um, of this show since I kind of gave you. I'll give you my final summary from start to finish. I thought that each match was really really well executed. I know people some people are disagreeing with me on the uh, the um, the uh, the uh, Baron Corbin uh, match, um, but like I said, I think that there was a lot of great in-ring uh, development for his character and a really good setup for his match with Bull Dempsey, um, who uh, I just want to point out on the sharpshoot was uh, compared to King Kong Bundy, and uh, then Aussie followed up by saying. Rest in peace, King Kong Bundy. Um, I would just like to say that King Kong Bundy is actually still alive, you dipshit. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. He's 100% living. He actually does uh, comedy acts. He's a kind of a stand-up comedian now. Um, just uh, really adding to the pot there, saying that... Uh, really saying that uh, they don't... Over at the sharpshoot, they par they obviously don't do their homework. Um, so, for those of you who stayed behind and continued uh, in overtime, we were almost an hour and roughly an hour and ten minutes in. Um, I wanted to say thank you for for continuing this far in the podcast. Uh, you are a saint. Um, I can't believe you stayed this far, all one of you. Um, I'm just assuming. Um, but I kind of wanted to, and I wasn't going to bring this up, but I kind of feel like I've been kind of egged on, and I feel like I've, I've, I kind of need to bring this up. Um, I, I did watch the sharpshoot um, because I do support my friends, and I do enjoy the sharpshoot. I think it's a great show, and I do enjoy React. I like being on it. I know I like to, to uh, you know, I've been kind of, throwing, you know, jabs at them, friendly jabs. We have this competition because there's there's a uh there's you know, there's the golden ropes coming up and there's a category for um best podcast or podcast of the year. Um and it's us three going head to head, so we've been kinda of throwing jabs. Um but I kinda of feel in a sense that uh you know, Aussie is kinda of, I feel like he's kinda of taking this a little too seriously. I feel like you know, I don't know. I, I think this is becoming a little bit more than competition for him. Um, you know, he, some of some of the jabs he threw uh, at at me on the sharpshoot were kind of uncalled for, in my opinion. Um, really felt, you know, I, I'm not too sure if he was joking or not. It felt kind of a little bit like there was some seriousness in what he was saying um, about the fact that um, that my show can't hold a candle to his, um, that he really doesn't think that my show should be in, in contention with his or Alex. Um, um, I know he, uh, you know, said things like, uh, you know, I, I don't have an awesome graphic like he has, and uh, you can't even see my face, and then he had to, of course, throw in there, not that any, you know, not that anybody would want to. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to take, take this up with a grain of salt, um, and then he said that I was going to throw jabs at him, um, and then had, of course, had to add in, not like anybody will hear it, um, you know, it's not that the jokes themselves are bothering me, because they're just jokes at the end of the day, but it's the way he said them, and the tone in which he used, um, to say them, I don't know, I just kind of feel like he's, he's, I don't know, I feel like he's being a little bit too serious about this competition, so if you're listening to this, bud, it's just a competition. Um, it's fans will vote, and if you win, good for you. And if I don't win, that's awesome. Um, looking at the votes, I don't think I'm gonna win. Um, I truly think my podcast is the best, but that's that's just because you know that's how that's what you have. To, if you want something to be successful, you have to truly believe in your heart that it's the best. I truly believe mine's the best, and. Uh, You know, he, you know, he he called a lot of stuff out. Um, I don't know. I know I said some things about him in this podcast. You know, anger got the best of me. Um, you know, he's making fun of me and saying nobody wants to see me. And um, 
all that kind of stuff. And I know I made fun of his Johnny Bravo haircut. I didn't. Oh, well, I meant to. Uh, yeah, so he's got that going for him. Um, but I just wanted to point out two things, that if you're going to vote on podcast of the year, I just want to reiterate the fact that neither React or The Sharpshoe are technically a podcast. So technically, by default, I should just win. Um, I still want to win. Um, hopefully he's not serious. Hopefully it is just all in good fun. Hopefully he's not taking this too seriously because I do just want what's best for this company. Um, um, you know, me making fun of the Johnny Bravo haircut, his giant nose, um, you know, saying things like, uh, I don't know, why don't you go take some goddamn, uh, Allegra, take some allergy medications, really hard to listen to with all that mucus in your sinuses, um, you know, just things like that, it really is all in good fun, and I mean nothing by it, um, you know, but at the end of the day, see, at the end of the day, there's a reason, though, that Rope Break uh, Wrestling has three podcasts, it's because we want to give you guys what you want, maybe not everybody wants to listen to an audio cast, so that's why you got React, and why you got uh, Before the Bell, or why you got React and why you got uh, the Sharpshoot. Maybe you don't want to watch a video cast. Maybe you just rather listen to it. That's why I made this one because I figured, you know what, it's going to be easier for you guys to listen to. If you're at work and you're doing your thing and you know you're stocking your shelves at wherever you're working, um, working at Walmart. Oh, don't even get me started about Walmart. Holy shit. Nope, nope. We're not going into Walmart again. Did that before. We're not doing that. Um, Maybe maybe you're at work, the boss is giving you a hard time, you're trying to vent, maybe your mom's yelling at you to clean up your damn room. Alright, mom, I'm making it easier for you. All you gotta do is throw in your headphones, and I think I found a way to upload this online so that you guys can subscribe to my podcast and never have to go to YouTube again. I think that I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. That way you can use uh, whatever podcast app you use. Um, I use Podcast One. I believe that's what it's called. Oh, maybe not. No, that's the site that people use. But I use... Oh, I lied. I use um, Beyond Pod on Android. I, I run Android, so if, download Beyond Pod. Um, or there's also Podca Podcast Addict. Just go to... Uh, I'm going to play Michael Cole for a minute. Go to your device's app store, the Play Store on the Android device, or the App Store on the, I, on, on the iPhone. Um, and then just type in podcast, and it should pop up. Uh, Apple has their own podcast app, so that's not shouldn't be too difficult. And then type in before the bell, hit search, subscribe, done. That's all you ever have to do for the rest of your life. It'll automatically upload new episodes. Um, so hopefully you're listening to this as a subscriber, and not on YouTube because that's a pain in the ass and it wastes a lot. If you're listening to this on your phone and you're at work, you know how much battery that wastes. You know how much battery it wastes to watch. Before the or to watch uh, react, to watch the sharpshoot, waste a lot of battery. Um, I also just wanted to say that there is a reason why before the bell is last on the list of podcasts for rope break wrestling, and uh, that's simply put, you know when you eat something and it tastes absolutely disgusting and it leaves a terrible taste in your mouth. So you reach for something you know tastes great just to get that taste out of your mouth? That is Before the Bell. Before the Bell helps you get the terrible taste of the sharpshoot out of your mouth. That's what I'm here for. It's what I do. Um, once again, just friendly jabs. I don't mean anything by it. Much love for Aussie and his podcast. I wish him all the best. Um, and same thing with Alec. I wish React all the best. And uh, with that being said... It's that time of the show already, an hour and 15 minutes in, not too shabby, I think that's pretty much what I said, um, so it was pretty accurate, um, so, it's about time to wrap up, it's about time to say goodbye, don't cry, don't, it's okay, it's okay, it's, it's gonna be alright, um, I'll be right back here on Friday, you don't have to, it's gonna be alright, it's gonna be okay, I'm here for you, um, but I do have to say something. 
And I gotta say this, and, uh, by the way, Aussie stole this from me, um, because he can't obviously come up with anything original. Uh, he kind of took this, but it's mine and will always be mine. It's so clever, that's why he had to take it, because, you know, it was very clever. If you got a friend that doesn't know anything about RopeBreakWrestling.com, that do your friend a favor and bring him on over. Because if, if he doesn't know about it or she doesn't know about it, not only are you being a bad rope breaker, but you're being a terrible friend to that person, that individual. You are, you are hoarding rope break from them. That's not fair. You are being selfish. So come on, bring him over to the rope break lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle. It really, really is a lifestyle. I live by it. I believe in it. And yes, it's my brand, but I really truly, it's for the fans, by the fans. I started it with a purpose to entertain you guys, to give you something to look forward to. And I hope that we've all, uh, I hope that me, Ozzy, and Alec have been able to deliver that. There's so much more coming. Um, we have a lot of guest announcers on the Golden Ropes, so make sure to turn into that, tune into that. Big things coming for Rope Break, really excited about so bring your friends on over to the lifestyle, because if they're not living the rope break lifestyle, then the fact of the matter is they're not really living. And that is not me being biased. That, my friends, is just the f a fact of life. And uh, that's really all I got to say about that. So bring them on over, ropebreakwrestling.com, bookmark that bad boy, facebook.com slash ropebreakwrestling, twitter.com slash ropebreakwrestling, all those links will be in the description. Don't even worry. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, you know, keep keep watching out on Facebook. We have a lot of great things coming. Um, and I just want to shout do, do a quick uh, shout out to our Golden uh, Ropes sponsor, ProWrestlingTees.com. Uh, it has jumped on to sponsor us for the Golden Rope Awards. i um, very excited about that. Um, so... Really, really appreciate their sponsorship. Um, if if you're in need of an awesome wrestling-related T-shirt, go on over to ProWrestlingTees.com. They have everything. They have they are official merchandise of WWE former WWE superstars like Mick Foley, Razor Ramon. Go check them out. They have so many different T-shirts. Macho Man Randy Savage, the Ultimate Warrior. They're the official distributor of New Japan Pro Wrestling. So go check them out. One hell of a site they got going. Some amazing merchandise. And you can even help support some local or some, uh, you know, some, some other podcasters who, who, you know, also have t-shirts on there. Um, we are looking to get there as well. If we can get 2,000 likes on Twitter, we can open up our own shop and we can start selling rope break t-shirts. Um, I know Aussie also said that nobody would want to buy it before the bell t-shirt. Um, I hope you guys would want to buy one. Um. So, that's that. That's the end of the show. There's nothing left for me to say. I know I can hear the collective sighs of relief. Holy shit, he's finally done. I thought there was going to be more. I thought this show was going to be better. Well, it's only going to get better with your suggestions. So, do me a favor. Throw some comments in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Tweet me, at Roper Grassland or at Real Matinato. Hashtag Before the Bell or BTB. Um, and let me know what you think. Do you, do you like the show? How can I make it better? How can I make it more entertaining for you? Like I said, I'm trying to get it on iTunes. Hopefully I'll get some nice intro and outro music. Um, make it sound like a real podcast. Um, I'm working on all this stuff. I'm looking to take this to the top, number one. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoy doing it. Um, thank you guys for listening this long. If you've been listening this long, you're long, you're a true fan, and I really appreciate it. Unlike the uh, selfish jerks over at Sharpshoot, uh, again that wasn't a jab. That was just uh, me being, uh, you know, competitive. Just a friendly jab. I love those guys. Um, thanks for thanks for listening. Uh, tune in next week, Friday, same exact time. It'll be Friday at noon Eastern. Around, you know, I say noon, could be 12.30, but I try to keep it in that time frame. So tune in next week for another edition of Before the Bell, same exact time, same 
exact place.